practices and rename the other one appropriately. Here we go. Okay, um, so I've been leading through some best practices, things like the convolute positions, peer review, um, to, to mention a few examples. Um, I want to talk today about a set um, that include a variety of process best practices, but these include um, as well a, a technical item that I want to talk about. And it's responsive actually to a question that Matt came up with uh, earlier uh, to me at the beginning of the class where he asked about testing for this class. And, and the question was, is automated testing allowed for this class? And I said not merely is automated or automated test tool use allowed? And the answer is not only yes and emphatically yes, uh, it is required that you engage in automated testing of your system. But I distinguished here between two types of automated testing. And I distinguished between them functionally, not in the sense of a functional programming language, but in the sense of what they accomplish, okay? Um, so when we think about automated testing, automated tests, um, we can broadly classify this into two pieces, okay? One of them are tests that are UI based. They're through the user interface. I don't know how many of those in the room are familiar with the broad set of tools that are out there, but, but uh, some of the more prominent ones include things like um, uh, Selenium, um, uh, Water is still extant, um, uh, W-A-T-I-R. Uh, there's, there's tools on the Java side, things like JRobot. Um, uh, and these basically drive an application, whether it's a smartphone or tablet-based application, mobile application or a web-based application, it drives it through a UI. So it's almost as if it acts like the user, you know, it's pressing submit buttons and filling in fields and all that sort of good stuff. And it's, it's has to get through the UI, okay? The other component is what I would call programmatic, for lack of a better term for it, okay? Programmatic testing. And this doesn't operate through the UI. If you think about it, look, um, if you go and you fill out a form on a, on a UI and you press a button um, to submit, say, it calls off to some underlying logic, some business logic, to handle the things that were filled in with the text fields or selections that were made or drop downs that were selected, right? It, it calls off to sort of process those things and do something. Maybe it updates a bank record, maybe it you know, does a query against the database and shows the results, right? Um, in any case, programmatic testing dispenses with the need for the UI what it does is it is calling off to the underlying code of your system with particular sets of arguments or particular types of information, you know, has a record in the database that there are several records for a test case and then calls off and says process these things or, or it says, you know, call for the airline routing algorithm to go from Saskatoon to Boston, you know, leaving on this date, getting into there at, at this date, flexible dates, you know, and, and under some particular test scenario, tries it out. And this comes in two types. And I want you to know about this for your, for the expectations, ladies and gentlemen, for your product. Okay? Two types. Type one, unit testing. And the other type is higher levels of testing, okay? Um, uh, which, which basically involve um, several variants. Uh, integration tests. Um, here you're, what, anyone know what an integration test is? Yeah. It's like between classes and yeah. things like that. That's right, you have two classes. Maybe each of them work with respect to unit tests. They, they accomplish the tasks um, per some specification written, perhaps, um, per, per expectation, perhaps, of the programmer, only, if they don't have specifications written down. 
Um, but maybe they don't play nicely together because maybe one interprets one as you know success and zero as failure, and the other the reverse way. And they're both reasonable as implementations, but they make different assumptions. For example, or you know each assumes the other handles a certain awkward case or something like that. So integration testing will test like component A with component B. Okay, um, and this is an integration testing. Um, and uh, then there's also system testing, okay? Where you're basically running use cases, use cases with your system. By use cases, I mean complete sets of functionality like you might invoke as a user. For example, if you're performing a search and you are selecting the results and ordering it or what have you. You are scrolling through a document and uh, you know, making a modification and then closing the document. It's a, it's a use case. It's a kind of meaningful delivery of value for some tasks for a user. And system tests put the system through the testing. Now, could you do that through the UI? You most certainly could. But system tests, we often just write programmatically, directly against the logic. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? Why would you write those you know, uh, programmatically rather than going through the UI? After all, the logic is in the UI to, to handle, at least at some point, to handle you know, use, uh, use cases. Why, why do it through programmatically? Yeah? It's a pain in the ass to go through the UI. Well spoken, young man. Well spoken. <laughs> um, it, yeah, it's um, going through the UI is painful to create scripts often, but what's even more painful is the fact that if you look at different areas of an application, certain areas of the application evolve quicker than others. What's something that might evolve less dramatically? Once a program is created, once a system is created, what's an area of it that might evolve? It evolves, but it evolves at a slower pace. On the database schemas involved, for example, the data model, sort of back end model there. Or the aspects of the business logic, the rules of your business. You know, that this sort of request for a travel, for a travel leave um, has to be approved by this manager, this manager, and this manager. Or, you know, the rules by which when you book a flight from one city to the other city that you search for, you know, flights through coach share partners as, as airlines. These business logic rules that tell you sort of about how you can do things or how you must do things, those things often evolve fairly slowly. What things might evolve more quickly for an application? Yeah. The UI. The UI. <laughs> the UI, ladies and gentlemen. It might evolve quite quickly. Why money fall? Well, new versions of Android come out, new versions of, of iPhone come out, new types of uh, tablets or models come out. Um, people are tweaking the UI for user experience. They're putting in, you know, different ways of doing things, you know, more specialized ways for doing common cases. The UI is often undergoing churn at a much higher rate than these backend stuff. Now, what does all that have to do with testing? I may be sure, but what does that have to do with testing? Yeah, what's that? Yeah, you break your tests. It breaks your tests unless you update them. The UI gets updated. Now you have two buttons that you have to deal with rather than one. Your code to deal with one button ain't going to work. It's just like you told the tester, press this button, you know, here's the script you go through. They couldn't run that script anymore. Maybe there's no button anymore. Maybe it's a link you click on. Or maybe, you know, these two pieces of functionality have been combined into one. So you're always updating. The UI is horrible. Now, when you folks were young, um, this was a lot worse. When, 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 you were, when you were before the age you were likely to be programming, this was horrible. Like pixel level adjustments. Like you, you brought the button over, you made the button slightly larger, you changed its color, would break UI testing. Because it would look for, it would go to like that exact pixel and push a button. Try to push a button, right? And it would miss the button or something. 
or it wouldn't be able to find the button, and it would give up, and it would, you know, be unhappy. Um, and the tester would be unhappy as a result, the people running those tests. So UIs change a lot. Even these days, they tend to change much faster, and a lot of UI code is, is fairly, um, fairly brittle test code um, that operates through the UI. There's another reason, though, that we don't do UI testing all the time. What is it? Besides, suppose you didn't have to worry at all about this breaking. Yeah. I don't know if this is where. Yeah, yeah, you can't tell. Okay, okay, so you, you press submit and it says system updated. Did the system update? You know, um, did, it, did it really update? Um, sometimes it's a bit opaque. Now, sometimes you pair it with another thing which then goes and retrieves it and makes sure the results obtained is that. But you're still, it's kind of like you're trying to figure out what's going on in this cabinet without being able to go in there, and, you know, based on only what's outside, right? So you like throw things in there and see how they bounce out and, and you try to figure out what's inside there. It's a, not a great analogy, but you know, use your imagination, right? Um, you're trying to figure out what's going on in your car without being able to open the hood, right? Um, all you can deal with is like what's coming out of your car, the exhaust, the sounds, you know, the light. Um, the flames. Um, you know, they, this is not a great position to be in, right? Yeah. Like sometimes, like programs have debug mode that actually prints out output. Correct. Correct. And you can do UI testing with debug mode. It then is more used. You're not actually testing the final product often, um, you're t because that would be a different experience than the user has, and it might affect the experience. But you might be able to use it. I mean, where, where you use it is with logging that won't change the visible behavior, but it logs things. That's a big thing. And that gets into issues of, it's going to be a big part of this course, a big theme, testability. So you design your system to be testable. And one part of it is logging. Another part is special scripting interfaces. Another part of it is actually use of assertions, which I'm coming to. Another part of it is putting in place hooks so you can inquire, did this actually get updated? What is, you know, what's the state of this uh, certain part of the database? Yeah? Uh, in, general, in general, right? Like, yeah, it's, uh, it's UI like a static program, rather than like, if you change the logic, yeah. like, do you need to have to update the UI? You, you, sorry, uh, if you change the logic, do you what? Do you, do you necessarily have to update the UI? You, you don't necessarily update the UI, you're saying. Yeah, it, it may not be obvious. It may be hard to determine, did that new logic run? Yeah. Because maybe you get the same result for your flight routing, and the question is, did it use the new algorithm? Maybe the new algorithm and the old algorithm use the same result. And so you end up designing test cases that get quite intricate, whereas you wish you could just say, Hey, did it get updated under the covers, right? So UI testing is difficult for that, but there's another big reason we don't do it for everything. Another huge reason, performance, ladies and gentlemen. UI testing tends to be slow. Going through the UI tends to require the application to put a lot of work in to updating. Guess what? The UI. And, and it actually tends to really slow down performance by sometimes orders of magnitude. Just the fact that you have to maintain this UI for your tests, you know, click here, do this, it requires an emulator often, you know, an emulator simulating the full phone functionality, like here's your Android phone, click here, do this, and you're simulating the full phone UI just to test your thinking little application, you're simulating, you know, updating the clock and audio messages and so on. So performance can really suffer from UI testing. And so it's a big issue. Of them though, the biggest one is the drag of updating this, your, your code base. It's updating your code base to track the UI. And sometimes if you're not looking, your code they think it works properly because there's been no error message, but actually the code didn't, didn't do the right thing to trigger the error message. 
And so you've got to be very careful you're not fooling yourself. The test worked. Some years ago, I got, a, I got students to submit a report to me. And they said, all our tests passed successfully. And they gave three thumbs up. Um, I guess one of them was a big cup. And they, they gave this for test after test after test. And then I went and I looked at the actual output from these tests. And each one of them, for the first, I don't know, maybe 20 or something, it said, like, the, the, there were a lot of messages. Good. Good step forward. A lot of messages were like, could not log in. You know, invalid <laughs> username. The next one, invalid username. Invalid username. Of course, they said it succeeded because it didn't cause an error in the system. You know, like when doing the task. But it just couldn't log in to try it at all. So you got to be careful with UI testing, interpret the results, knowing did the results succeed. You got to somehow scrape it off. Like, we are expecting this result. It should look like this, and you compare it with a bitmap or something, or it has this text in it. it yeah, it can be nasty. Problematic testing, you're actually calling your code. You can have, you probably should have done this, right, in 370 under Chris Duchin? Did you have test hooks? Did you call things with assertions? I know, I know Professor Duchin very well. He and I have uh, many points of shared, uh, uh, shared aesthetics. Um, some points of differences, too, with respect to programming and, and <laughs> agile processes and so on, but we have many points of shared conviction. And um, he probably taught you quite well about programmatic testing so in, in the small. Now, when we talk about programmatic testing, as I say, it's divided into sets. A very important point, and this got into Matt's question, excellent questions. There are different parties conducting testing. Okay? And I wish I had multicolored chalk here. This would be like a perfect time. These ones done in a, you know, a, a, a wide border are conducted by testers traditionally. Okay? These are test team provinces. Traditionally, the test teams create the higher levels of testing, system tests. Also in here is acceptance tests. Um, Whereas the programmers um, often do the unit testing. Okay, so that's predominantly the developer who has to do that. Now let me ask this. And this is going to link together a set of things that we're talking about in this class. Okay, so I said I said that integration testing tests like A with B and C, where maybe A calls B and C, right? It calls off to some other classes, right? A is a class, maybe it calls off to B and C, or maybe A is a method of a class and it calls methods B and C, right? You can imagine that. And I said integration testing tests them together. So you call A, calls B and C. Can you do unit testing of, of A without calling B and C? Can you do unit testing of A without calling B and C? The code of A calls B and C. And I argue that it's, it's integration testing if it's actually calling B and C. You're testing them together. You're testing, you know, because if there were a bug in B, it would show up often an A failing. Or if there were a bug in C, it would show up often an A failing. So it's kind of a, a combined test of, of all, right? So, but if you have A calling B and C, can you do a unit test? I mean, how, what's it? What's the difference? I mean, unit test, oh, I want to do a unit test of A. I don't want to do an integration test, but it calls B and C, it didn't withdraw. How can I, how can I do it? Do I just give up? You have to mock B and C. You mock it. Beautiful. You mock it. So you have A, and the code calls off to B and C, but maybe you don't want to test B and C, you want to test A. And you want to sharply test A, A. like you want, to, you want to test it in a way that you can really, you know, give it a run for its money, really try it out with specific things. And so what you do is you mock out B and C, you substitute fake versions of it. And there's actually a subtle difference between fakes and mocks. Fakes are more simple things, yeah, it like returns a fixed value, or returns a random number. That would be a fake of B or C. Mock, mocks are often more sophisticated. Like they'll, maybe they have state. Maybe they, you know, the first time they're called, they return zero, later one. 
Um, or maybe um, they test, they, they keep track of have they been called more than once? And if so, they report an error. This you should only call it once. Um, or maybe they confirm that certain arguments are non null or are positive integers or never decrease or what have you. So, so mocking provides a way of testing A without, in fact, testing B and C. They're actually substituting doppelgangers, sort of fake things for B and C. Okay? And, ladies and gentlemen, um, when you do that, you often find it can allow you to test A more completely because you have, you know, you can give it back certain values, like a null value, or you can give it back a negative value, or you can give it back, a, you know, a set of values, not just one, or whatever it is, to sort of test it out in a very specific way. So you can design your test with different mocks to test different things about A. That's a very useful thing. But there's another reason we do mocking. Besides, we don't want to test B and C. What's another reason? As you're doing software development over the next bunch of weeks, what's another reason you might test B, B, A, and you might mock B and C, even though you still have A, A um, even though that you, you, you're open to testing it with them? Why? Yeah. Um, because you may not have them fully functioning yet. Exactly. No. They may not be developed yet. They're not a point of, of being suitable for testing yet. Or they may, be, uh, they may have some known bug with a known cause that right. you essentially want to test around. Exactly. You, don't, you know B is basically broken for some common things. And if you start testing A with it, you're not going to really get anywhere. right? Um, and so you end up testing it with a mock of B for that reason. It's an expedient because it isn't yet you know, fully developed. Mocking is your friend, ladies and gentlemen, and it plays a key role within testing. Mm -hmm. And you will need to try to put in place mocking for this class. And you will want to put in place different types of test regimes, ladies and gentlemen, for this class. Now, for the team doing Oculus-based methods, in particular Oculus on Unity, one of the things that you folks need to grapple with early and grapple with often is testing in Unity. How do you conduct programmatic tests? How do you conduct UI-based testing in Unity? It is not sufficient, and I emphasize this again, to say testing cannot be done in Unity. Frankly, before. It, it, and we know how to do testing in Unity, you know, to, to, with certain methods. But also, technology has been developing, and I suspect you'll find some other method, nuclear developed methods up there that weren't there two years ago when a team ran into this. Um, so you'll want to be thinking about how do you perform tests in your environment of choice. If you have an Android development project, you're going to want to know about testing in Android. If you have a web-based system, you're going to want to know about web test technologies. If you're doing something with React, you're going to know, want to know about you know, Jest and Mocha and Synon for, for mocking. Um, there's a whole ecosystem of testing-related technologies that are platform-specific. And not just that, but testing-related tricks, they'll be platform-specific. So you folks who want to know about these things. You want, to, you want to give those some thought, and I'd be glad to dialogue with you. I'd be also be glad to link you up with some people who have run previous tests or previous uh, projects involving your platforms of choice. Okay? Um, so that was a bit on testing, a bit on mocking, uh, and, and a bit on division of responsibilities in the team. Okay? Um, Mocking supports testing. Okay, any questions about that before I talk about assertions? Another key thing is supportive tests. One thing I will look for in your project is test documentation. Documentation of your test. What's the purpose of this test? Why, why would you document purpose other than to satisfy us? Why would you document 
the purpose of the test. Well, look, things evolve. So much, ladies and gentlemen, so much of software development is spent dealing with the fact that things change. And when things change, often things break. What changes? People on a project change. You don't want your project to be broken when someone leaves it, when someone gets hit by a bus. What else changes? Versions of the underlying system, right? New versions of Oculus come up, right? Or new versions of WebVR, new versions of Unity. What else changes? Well, you know, libraries, right? Extending that. New versions of libraries come out that you depend on. Maybe they're not backwards compatible, or maybe maybe they um, they allow you to do things that you used to do, you know, separately. Now that you can do it together. You don't have to make two calls. You can do it in one. Things change, ladies and gentlemen. Things change. Use cases change for the customer. The needs on the business side change. I don't mean necessarily commercial business. I mean, the, the, the required logic might change. Now you have an extra level of reporting, and so you have to change the approval process or whatever. Things change. And one. One of the consequences of that is that you know it can break our systems and it can break our testing. And it's worth putting effort into tools often that will buffer us from the change. And a lot of the art of software engineering is, is designing abstractions and designing structures in our systems that will limit the effects of expected changes or common changes. So we put in place strategic flexibility to easily add common use cases as they might be changing, or to add in certain functionality because we anticipate it coming. You should be thinking about that. Um, tests will also break. Documentation of tests, the purpose of a test, for example, will help limit the effects of change. So if the purpose of this test is something that is no longer needed, with a new version of Unity, which allows you to handle this type of, you know, grab thing input. Oh, I don't know what it's called, grab thing. Oh, <laughs> that's a great term. I like. Let me let me let me point you to the grab things up there in the room. Um, so, if Unity, if if uh, it has good support for the new grab thing, or the you know a better support for the existing grab thing. Um, uh, then maybe your test that you used for the old version of the grab thing isn't needed anymore. Um, you may have tests in place who's, who's, because of a UI redesign, whose job is no longer needed. And if you don't know what the test does, you end up just kind of putting more work into it to try to update it before you realize, oh, wait, this doesn't make sense. So, so knowing the purpose of a test is really important to know how it needs to evolve in light of, of change. And what it means if it fails. What is it testing? Like, what is it trying to get at? What is it trying to test? Or if you have something for Android and you want to roll it up for iOS, the purpose of the test will clue you how you might work to create a comparable functionality in iOS, even though it's different in its details. So purpose of tests are important. Uh, who created them? Um, you know, uh, the, what, what requirements they have to run. Maybe it's certain system requirements. Um, what, what their expected output should be. Um, what requirements they're testing or what elements of the design they're testing. Um, these, are, these are things you, you should plan on documenting for the test. And you should have reviews of them. And you might also have steps of the test document at a high level and have that reviewed before you actually implement the test, okay? Um, okay, those are some things about tests. Any questions regarding what I've covered in this session thus far? I'd like to talk now about additional technology, which I think all of you have seen, or many of you have seen, which is use of assertions. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a broadly a, a subset of what I would call offensive programs. Not in the sense that it's obnoxious, but in the sense that it is 
It's not merely defensive, like trying to avoid crashing if the user, user enters something unexpected. By the way, which is required in this class. I know certain users who will enter unexpected things for your, your interfaces, and, and you should you need to plan for that. Um, uh, but offensive programming goes beyond defensive programming, just protecting ourselves from events that happen to us, to actually go out and ferret out problems. Why would you want to trigger problems? Why would you want to go, go cause problems to happen with your system? That sounds perverse. Why would you want to do that? Yeah. try something like that. Um, or you put in place something that, that will actually detect if a problem is occurring, and then you try to see if you can get it to show, show with that as a symptom that it's a problem. So you fill memory, for example, with illegal values to see if this might be something like C code, to see if it's if it's reading illegally from some, say illegally, it's reading from a place it's not supposed to, it will get something that's a value that it doesn't know what to do with. You fill it with minus ones. And if it's reading things in the, if your code depends on uninitialized values having a value of zero implicitly, you didn't know that, but it, it depends on it, and it gets minus one, maybe it will blow up. And he was saying, why do you want it to look? Because you want it to reveal that there's a bug. Because otherwise the bug is hidden. You don't see it, right? It, it's, it's hidden. You don't know that it's depending on it. You don't know it's got a loose pointer and it's reading way off in memory space and who knows what. And it's just a matter of time, one out of 100 times it breaks. Where oddly, the one out of 100 times is when it's in use by the vice president, right? Um, you know, or you, you fill it with illegal data just before it's deleted. So if there's anything that's still pointing to it, it'll blow up and you'll know about it. Basically, you know early and you know on. You know, you set buffer as the end of heat, so if you overwrite it, it'll trigger a page fault. This is, this is more low-level stuff, but you have the same, same ideas, okay? Um, and I'll just, since it's best practice, I'll just talk about them right now. Um, so with assertions, we're, we're going to be using a technique that's part of offensive programming, this arsenal of techniques we use to go out there and find errors. And what do assertions involve? Can anyone tell me? What do you do with an assertion? What is an assertion doing in your code? You put in assertions. And I want to see your code with lots of assertions in this. What do those assertions do? What's their job in mind? Yeah. Well spoken. Well spoken. Your name again? Mesa. Mesa. Thank you. I have a I have a bad tendency to to bin people and identify people by place rather than name. And Mesa was like there like in the first <laughs> class over here, and now he's here. And so it's going to take a while because I, I kind of hash people with a certain appearance in the same bucket, where my buckets are pretty big. Um, and I'm not very, <laughs> so, so I, I rely on things like, like locational cues. And so 
It'll sink in eventually, okay? I tell you by the final exam, I'll, I'll have you, I'll have it, have it in it. Um, so thank you, thank you for tolerating that. Um, uh, so an assertion tests assumptions. It tests developer assumptions. This, like that this thing is equal to that, or this thing is non-negative. Um, this string is, it has a smaller length than this one that's produced. Right? Um, this value has not decreased, or this quantity is the same value as it did at the top of the loop, or what have you. So, assertions are basically testing for violations of assumptions. And the idea here is the developer is counting on these assumptions being true. They're counting, this is the case, this thing is not negative, or the, the value of this index is between zero and the length of the array minus one. Because they're coming on it in their code. And if that is false, if their assumption is false, then there's something broken about their reasoning. Like, oh, you should only be passing to this function values within that range. Or this code should only compute values at that index that lie within that range. And it captures, therefore, logic errors. Okay. Um, Assertions uh, allow us to spot errors quicker than they would otherwise spot. Because, ladies and gentlemen, this is one of the key distinctions. Man, this is almost certain to be on the exam, final exam. Ready? Okay. Get out those pen. Okay. Um, I'll go through. I'll throw in a lot of these nuggets. I like to throw in more nuggets. There's people absent from class a lot. When it's really low, Kevin's day. I'll, I'll just. Four, four. Maybe I'll stop my recording. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you gotta know, like, this, don't forget that, you know, this is the third thing, you just gotta know. And people are rewarded for, for coming to spend time with their teammates, right? Um, but if you tell me you're sick, okay, I'll send you the recording. <laughs> okay. Ladies and gentlemen, or if you have an interview for the internship program or some other legit extent. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's um, uh, so talk about the use of, of uh, assertions and its relationship to this fundamental distinction that will be on the final, I'm almost positive. And that's the distinction, ladies and gentlemen, between a, between a fault and a failure of the system, okay? So we have code bases, we have big code bases, okay? Um, I'm responsible for some quite big code bases, in the hundreds of thousands of lines, for example. And when we have these code bases, often our tests that we run with them, whether unit tests or integration tests or system tests, they come back with problems. They, they alert us to problems. But what a test does um, when it runs through and there's a problem that occurs, maybe it's a uh, assertion failure, maybe it's a, um, it's a crash, maybe it halts you know, um, uh, the system, maybe it freezes up, right? Um, maybe it computes the wrong value and you see it. Those are all failures caused by the system. Those are all what we classify as a failure. It's, it's some visible indication that the system failed. It's a visible indication the system malfunctioned. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, a failure is a symptom. Now, what caused that failure, ladies and gentlemen, is a fault. It's an underlying problem. This is the as we say, the etiology, E-T-I-O-L-O-G-Y. You don't have to know that for the final, but I'll be impressed if you do. Um, the fault is the underlying cause of the problem. It's the mechanism that you know, is going wrong that causes the failure. And the problem is that often in large systems, large complex systems, the fault and the failure are not at the same place, right? I think you folks have been around Bush enough to know, and software developers. 
that sometimes the failure occurs in one place. Maybe when it's printing out, you see your wrong value. But the faults might lie in another module, right? It might, a lot, it might result from a, the fault might be you called off to something with a wrong argument, you know, um, in an entirely different part of the program. Or maybe, you know, you were supposed to write two values to a database that were different, and by copy paste, they were both the same value. Right? Um, the, the fault is the sort of mistake, the problem that gave rise to the failure. And often the fault is in a different part of the program. It's distal to the, to the failure. And often the fault occurs, well, the fault's going to occur before the failure at the same time, just before or long before it. But sometimes the, the problem is not obvious from the failure. The source of the problem is not obvious. What do we call the process of going from a failure to find out what the fault caused it? That process has a name. Debugging. It's debugging. We're, we're trying to figure out what is the problem that caused this, this symptom, right? And by the way, do not, one of the worst ways of debugging, <laughs> I've seen this a couple of times in my career, and it gives me the wills. More than that, it gives me the heebie-jeebies. Um, I mean, it can make me like leap up and, and, and you know, um, uh, a leap up in distress. Um, is where people confuse the faults and the failure. And to get rid of the problem, what do they do? They delete the symptom, right? <laughs> Say, oh, well, it's printing out the wrong value, so let's just eliminate the print statement. No, <laughs> the problem does not go away. The fault is still there, even if you don't have the obvious failure. So what we actually want here, you know, we often conflate them as runs, right? We think fault, failure, you know, uh, defects in the system are failures. We think of it as kind of going with failures. Uh, the program is crashing a lot. It's really buggy. Okay, it's a symptom, but if it doesn't crash a lot, it doesn't mean it's not buggy, right? Um, uh, and in fact, it's to our benefit to get it to fail early, fail often, if there's a fault. Because this is the, the problem is not the failure. The problem is the fault that lies underlies the failure. We want to find the fault. And the way to do that, sometimes counterintuitively, is to get us to fail early, fail often. Alert us to the fact that there's a problem. And one way to alert us to the problem is through, guess what? A circle, right? Right? I tried that one. <laughs> right? Um, a couple of years ago, two, two, three years ago, I got the award for the most steps walked <laughs> on campus <laughs> and lectures. And um, just recently, I, I lost my. Uh, my wristband for steps, but I can tell you it was true. It was awesome. I'd often get like about 10,000 steps in the middle of life. What that award did not give me, what I, I kind of felt was, it's just, you know, it's a goal for the people, is most steps are wrong in a Because you will find me running sometimes. Um, um, running, hopefully, without crash. Um, okay, so, ladies and gentlemen. Um, assertions help us trigger failures early and often if there's a fault. Why do we want to do that? Because if we trigger them early and often after a fault, amongst other things, they're close, it's closer to spot a problem, closer to the fault. It occurs more quickly. Maybe like right after the fault instead of five minutes later. Or maybe instead of five days later, after you open the file that was saved five days ago and you find, you know, it has bad values in it. Um, so, or that it crashes when it opens it. So ladies and gentlemen, faults are to be discovered. And if we litter our code with assertions, we put lots of checks in there, it's likely that we will find those sanity checks, those checks of our assumptions, those checks of our um, our, our beliefs um, about the situation um, 
we'll find that you know we identify something that shouldn't be the case. It just shouldn't be this way close to the fault. And so it allows us to trace back the fault. It's a big help, big help, ladies and gentlemen, for debugging. Because it lets us know sooner, you know, where the failure might be, it helps, or the fault might be, it lets us trace back to the faults more quickly. Yeah? So do your assertions trigger the fault or the failure? The, the assertions trigger the failure. Yeah, we don't want to cause faults. Um, actually, faults are the underlying problem. Generally, we don't put problems into our code base deliberately, but you'll see an exception later in the class where there's actually something called defect injection, where you actually put problems into your code base. Why would you do that? Anyone? Why would you put problems into your code base? Because you want to test the thoroughness of the testing. Of course, if you put them in there, you want to be able to prove them <laughs> quickly. And so there, there's actually tools that will like inject defects in. They remember where they are. You run your suite of tests. You see what fraction of them are caught. And what the fraction is that isn't caught. And what types are not caught. And it gives you clues how to improve your testing, and then with the tool you say, like, remove them all. <laughs> Sucks them all out. Of course, it doesn't suck the ones you didn't put. That's not your test. <laughs> um, well, was there a question back there? Yeah. I have one question. Uh, yeah. So the assertion in the case allows you to check where the fault is easier. Well, it, 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 the, so an assertion causes a failure if a Logical assumption of the developer is not is not the case. So the developer is counting on this. They're saying, make sure this variable equals that one, or make sure this variable is non-null, or make sure this is a valid index in the array, or make sure the array has all of its empty slots at its end, or make sure the array is less than a certain size as given by another variable. So the assertion is checking like you know, a programmer assumption, right? That they think this should always be the case, that I should be returning something that's longer than what I got in, for example. And it will fail, per this gentleman's comments. Um, it will fail, your name? Uh, Kareem. Kareem? Yeah, it will fail uh, if, it, if that assumption is not true. And that failure, often clues this in to the fact that there's a fault um, much, much earlier. Sometimes, you know, could, ladies and gentlemen, could there be faults in your code bases that you don't know about at any one time? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah, there could be... Yeah, maybe folks are... Are still brief on 90 years. It's a nasty one up there. <laughs> there can be lots of problems you don't know about in your code base because there's no failure to indicate them. Testing is getting in place checks that will you know, test the result is correct and that will be a failure when it fails. But if you don't put any tests, that doesn't mean there's no faults there. You know, if there's no problem there, you just don't know about them. Right? So, so, fail, uh, so assertions are a way of, of causing a failure early if there is a fault. If there's a fault in your reasoning, this makes it much more likely you will detect it and detect it early rather than, you know, two days later or after it's been written to the database and only later read and that and that. Right? Um, so, so, so assertions put in place failures to spot logical mistakes on the part of a program. And um, assertions um, trigger, uh, they stop the program, or log, or post a message via HTTP um, if you know, the checks fail. And in this class, I've asked you to put in place specifications for your code as well. Preconditions, postconditions, and variants. You folks have that in 370? Preconditions, postconditions? I know you don't like it, probably. But believe me, it'll 
prosperity or a lot of grief. And amongst other useful ways you can help reasoning, but it's one of the most critical things. But another thing you can do is put these directly into what? It begins with an A. It has two S's after it. Assertions. Assertions. Yeah, thank you. That's right. That's right. Um, so um, often we check preconditions, postconditions. Okay? Um, very, very right. And sometimes there's other invariants we'll be talking about later in class. Uh, history properties and uh, and uh, uh, properties that, that are true at, at any one time is invariant. Um, it can catch, you know, logical oversights, but in terms of properties of the data structure, this data structure is entirely empty or has no duplicates, you can check that, right? If I'm gonna check, this says no duplicate keys. If it has duplicate keys, I know there's a problem in my reasoning or someone else's reasoning has called me and I stop the program, I say, wait, there's something wrong here. You know, let's go find the fault. Okay. Um, internal consistencies of algorithms, right? Um, you can do this at a very high level. Um, for example, some years ago, a, a team, do you, do you folks use the transit app to take the bus? Here? Yeah. Um, there's Click and Go. I don't know if Click and Go is still around from Saskatoon. But um, some years ago, there was no bus app. Um, out there, and so students in this class created the first Saskatoon bus app. Okay. Um, and they had a really nice little algorithm for optimizing the selection of bus routes from A to B. So if I said I wanted to go from, you know, Varsity View to Airport at this certain time, it would use the bus tables and so on to reason through and recommend the buses. It was a really efficient algorithm. It was come up with by a senior developer in the industry in Saskatoon right now, whose name name was. Um, but just as they were about to hand in ID5, the final incremental deliverable, they discovered, and simultaneously I discovered, problems. Um, like it would, I'd say, I want to go to the airport, and it would tell me, okay, go to Place Real. You know, take the bus from Parsi View to Place Real, right? To Place Real. Take the bus to you know 23rd Street. Great. Down on the hub. Get off the bus. Great. Get off. Um, get back on that same bus. <laughs> get back, get off the bus again. Um, get off that car. <laughs> get off it again. Um, then switch to bus 11 to the airport or something. And um, that was that was not good. Um, they had put a lot of effort into this logical brainsmanship of this really efficient one of those really efficient algorithms to find it. And they had an efficient algorithm, it just was a broken algorithm. And one of the things they could have done is have a text in their code. Now watch this. Let me illustrate a subtle point. They could have had an assertion that would test if the result of the super efficient algorithm gave the same result as a brute force algorithm, which is really easy to write. Really easy to write a brute force. Now, a brute force algorithm, of course, is really what? So, so, that, so you might be recently asking, well, doesn't that void the whole point of creating a fast algorithm? After all, you call them both now, instead of just one. Why is that not a valid argument? Because assertions, ladies and gentlemen, don't, generally don't ship in final code. Assertions are in there for testing basis of a project. Assertions are not always. There's projects which adhere to rules where they do go into the final code base. But as a general rule, even if you put assertions in the final code base, you can enable which assertions go into the final code base and which don't. And what this means is, during testing, they could have been testing, is the result of their algorithm always provably, not provably, is it always the same as the brute force? And they could have spotted these issues much sooner. But they didn't. And guess who spotted it? They did pretty well, so. Good postmortem, good postmortem. Um, anyway, so, um, so that's, that's a little story for, for that, okay? So assertions, um, um, you know, projects differ in terms of whether they go in the, the final code or not. Uh, generally, you can enable whether or not it goes in. But assertions are good, use them early. Ladies and gentlemen, use them all, okay? Assertions are a way of increasing 
the testability of your system, much like this gentleman in your name, Kevin. Kevin. Kevin's points about logs, about scripting interfaces, special debugger modes, these are all really valuable for debugging and testing. Did it actually connect to the database? Did it write to that file? Did it, in fact, perform this query? We can look at those things and log in. Those help testability. And assertions, ladies and gentlemen, help testability. They help our test go further. Does that make sense? Help our tests accomplish more. A test without assertions can still test without assertions embedded in the code, at lots of places in the code, can still test that the test result gives the thing we're expecting. But a test that calls off the code chock a block full of assertions will often check a lot more things along the way because of the assertions throughout the code base. Ladies and gentlemen, give me assertions. Well, okay, I'm not gonna say give me assertions or give me death. Um, but <laughs> yeah, give me assertions, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, and and they will they will do you well. They're really easy to put in. I, I find myself when I write code, I just put them in like that because I I'm thinking, okay, is this is this thing less than? Oh, there's an assumption. Put it in. You know, this thing is non-null, so I can put it in. Put in the assertion. You know, wherever I'm I realize I'm thinking about assumption, I generally just stick an assertion. In. It's quick, painless. It's operational. It will be checked for you. And you know, if you're not sure about an you're, you're almost certain this is the case. Put an assertion, and then you don't have this gnawing feeling, well, maybe it's not the case, and things will blow up during the final demo. That'd be good, wouldn't it? To not blow up during the final demo? Yeah, I agree. Um, OK. Uh, any questions about assertions? Questions about assertions? Let me see. Assertions are your friend. Use them early. Use them often. They will pay back big time in debugging effort, effectiveness of testing, finding, finding bugs, enhance it. What's one other thing that they give you? They enhance the understanding of programmers who review the code. Right? If you're reviewing code full of assertions, maybe in an inspection, maybe just because you've got to work with that code, it's like the programmer's assumptions, even if they don't put them into comments, are documented operationally. They're awesome. They also allow for, if you know what assumptions are made, you can often optimize the code. Right? You know that this is the case, and you know that this thing only ever has a value you know, up to two possible maximum, maybe you unroll a loop or that's really expensive or something like that, okay? Okay, um, great. So I talked about uh, assertions, I talked about uh, peer reviews here and put together some uh, slides. Um, uh, incremental delivery, ladies and gentlemen, I spoke about it before, some, some of the motivations for incremental delivery, rolling things out. Well, you know, the stakeholder's needs change over time. The stakeholder often doesn't have a clear understanding of what you mean when you talk with them about, requirement, about what you're going to build and they need to see it. Um, you get checks on your interpretation of what the stakeholder has said to you. And, and, and by showing it to them, you can get in front of them. They get something. They get a sense of confidence the project's moving forward. But I also argue that it offered benefits in terms of uh, debugging. Um, because you gotta get the system working with all these, you know, the small set of new features. And you know, here in town, um, as worldwide, a lot of agile processes might use cycle times, like sprint times, times to deliver the next incremental deliverable of two weeks, sometimes a week, sometimes three weeks. In that time, code changes. But I'll tell you, it's a heck of a lot less code than changes in three months. And as a result, if you have errors that come in, there's a smaller bit of code that's changed than if you've been working three months and then tried to put all the pieces together to get the release set. 
So it's, it's fewer things change, and therefore fewer things where it could have gone wrong, and it's easier to check. These are some of the, some of the approach, but in, uh, you know, some of the benefits. But another one is that it can be risk-driven. You actually can deliver things for areas that are both high, higher priority for the stakeholder and higher risk. Why would you want to do risky things soon? Don't we want to push off risk? Why do risky things soon? Things that are that are that are risky. Like maybe you're thinking about using two technologies A and B later in the project. Um, why why examine that early? Yeah. You have more time to deal with it. Yeah. You have more more time to deal with it. If you know about the problem early, you have more time to scan for other technologies that will tie you over. Maybe discover incompatibilities between them in the first few weeks of the project. You, you know the the stakeholder is not absolutely counting on that functionality for another month, and so you have time to sort of find out you know replacement projects or talk with stakeholders about fallback mechanisms, etc. So. Doing things early, like checking out risks, is, is really valuable. And I want to introduce the notion here. I need to introduce, because it's going to be very important in the coming weeks for some of you, spiked prototypes. Often, ID1 for this class includes spiked prototypes that are, that are, that are featured there because they address areas of, of risk or uncertainty. A spike prototype basically, so this term prototype is often understood, uh, often misunderstood. Often people use it informally or less technical to mean it's, it's kind of a small scale version of the system. It's the first cut of the system. That isn't what it means in this class, and it isn't what it means for a large part of the industry. A prototype, ladies and gentlemen, means throwaway code. That's example. Yeah. Wow. These are my greatest hits, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, I know, you don't think I'll make them on the radio, but um, these are my greatest hits because they're, I'm trying to distill some very important principles. So these first couple lectures, they're worth listening to when the snows of December are upon us. <laughs> um, in the exam, and like the Iceman approach it, okay? So, ladies and gentlemen, prototypes are throwaway code. Spike prototypes have a very specific goal. Like they test out a certain technology. They test the compatibility of two technologies. They test, can WebVR be used with this newer version of Oculus? The Oculus, what is it called? The, the Oculus without the, the, the cords. Um, the sort of independent Oculus without a separate, computer, without a separate uh, driving computer. Uh, built in computational units. They're used to sort of probe certain uncertainties. You know, for example, will this certain technology be fast enough? Like maybe you're interested in Google Flutter and you want to know, will it be fast enough for rendering this type of animation? So all you do is like, your focus is on testing this one thing, getting an answer to this. And so you put together some throwaway code that cuts to the chase, doesn't have lots of these niceties, no splash screens, and I just focused on like getting an answer to this uncertainty. And it's a throwaway code, but you learn something. What you carry away from this is not code that you will then use per se as learning. You might learn how to use that thing and carry away that learning, but you're not going to reuse this code. The artifact is nothing, the learning is everything. Does that help? Spike part of that place. Okay, um, so here with the spiral model, often we, we do the risky things up front so we can know if, if that's a no-go, we know as early as possible, can plan around it, go in a different direction, uh, et cetera. And it requires some risk, uh, risk assessment. Um, okay, and I, I, want you to, I want you to factor that into your, to your plans, okay? Um, I will value it if you discover a problem early like you discover this is not compatible with that, that's a point of learning I will value. Like the fact that you went in and checked that out, I will say my hat's off to you. That's worth at least several features, you know, number of features 
you could have had because you probably will have headed off uh, potential, you know, uh, serious problems where you headed down that road and it was a, it was a dead end, and you can avoid going that way. You know, from now on. Okay, I want to talk about continuous integration, ladies and gentlemen. Continuous integration started back when I was a young software developer and one of the teams I worked in, which was the Microsoft Excel team. Small, team, twelve developers. Um, and uh, the kernels of a lot of the best practices worldwide involved in continuous integration, daily builds, involving project structure like project manager, debugging methodologies, and, or test methodologies, I should say. Um, the Excel team was at a leading, leading role in that, actually. And um, one of the reasons they used daily builds at that time, but, but that we use continuous builds, um, some of those reasons are listed here. Well, let me ask this. What is continuous integration? Can anyone tell me? What does it mean to have a, a CI process, a continuous integration process? Well, amongst other things, people are updating their code to the code base on an ongoing basis. Okay? They're checking it in, often daily on the fourth. Sometimes more frequently, sometimes a bit less. You're updating your code from the code base frequently, but you're, you're updating it to the code base in a way that causes a build to take place. Back then, we do them nightly. We do nightly builds. Okay? These days, our machines are much faster, and we do continuous builds, meaning instant builds. It's, it's you know, when you check it in, the system is built. And you folks will want to do this for your code bases. So if you have C-sharp code associated with Unity, it should be compiled when you check things in. If you have code written in you know, TypeScript, it will be compiled to put out, to put out um, uh, JavaScript, for example, or what have you. Um, depending on what language, if you have Swift code, it will be compiled when you check things in for your code base or iOS, uh, in, you know, in your iOS project as part of Xcode. Why do this? Why do this? Why this constant checking things in and have builds go? Well, that's cooperation. Look, um, if I'm checking in daily instead of every two weeks, there's a lot less chance I step on their toes. Because I'm always getting your changes, you're always getting my changes, and we're not duplicating order. Um, I'm less likely to do all swack of work which conflicts with your work that we only discover two weeks later. We're checking little bits, I get a little bit of yours, you get a little bit of mine, and we work on top of that. Okay? So it's, it really reduces integration headaches. We're not going in totally different directions, then we have to reconcile them weeks or months later. Uh, this used to be a big problem. It's called the Big Bang problem uh, when I was younger. It was, you know, people, uh, that projects would go months developing together. Um, sometimes it was different parts of a project, sometimes it was different developers in a given project, and you work on their features for months. I take these features, you take those features. And then we try to link them together, and guess what happens? A big one. A big bang. Yeah. Uh, they don't work. You get tons of compilers. There's one project that Microsoft wasn't Excel. It was called Project Omega. Okay? And it was actually what would have become an access. But it failed. Because for six months, they were still getting compiled errors. <laughs> and they couldn't get beyond the compilation stage. Um, it was just so many errors and compiling that, and eventually it was deep six. And then access was, a, was sort of half required, half developed. Anyway, um, I, I, a, a big, big issue is you more quickly identify problems. You're, you're doing this build back then nightly, now, in, you know, as soon as you check in. And so if you have a problem in your assumptions of your code, like you call off to a method that has changed name. You will know about it more or less immediately, right? You check in, you're told it won't compile <coughs> on the build system. And why is that? Well, it's because it was renamed, and so you fix your name, right? Um, you fix the name that it's called. Um, uh, if your code base 
was calling off to something with an argument that used to be able to be allowed to be null, but now the specification has changed, God forbid, um, to not allow that, you will know that sooner. So it allows you to spot problems earlier. It's again the whole idea of fail early, fail often. If there's a problem, know about it soon. And by checking my code in to work with yours soon, I know sooner if there's conflict in assumptions or problems. And less has changed. You know, I've only updated a change to this certain function. You've only updated a few lines to that method. And if I want to track down the source of the problem, why they aren't compiling together, or why they aren't playing together nicely in a test, I don't have to look very far. It's just this little area of code. If I check things in after a month, and I get all of your updates after a month, a lot has changed. And if the tests don't run, good luck. I've got to look through all these different uh, Um, Another thing is, in a technique we started back then, in the Excel team, you use smoke tests to test the state of the system. The idea is, you have a set of tests, higher levels of testing, unit tests, unit test suites, but you also have something called a smoke test. And the idea of a smoke test is not to locate bugs. No, it's not to find the location of bugs. It's to test, is the system sane enough that people should get the results of this checking. If I check something in and it hoses the system, if I check it in and it basically breaks the ability to, the, to log into the system, do I want other developers in my code to, to refresh and get my updates? No, they can't even do their testing. They can't do much productive work. So I want to know if a smoke test fails. If, this is basically to put the system through common use cases. And if it can't go through those use cases, something is hosed, something is broken, and we want to know about it ASAP so that we roll back. We roll back the build. We, we roll back the, the latest check-in because it's so broken that the basic functionality of the system won't work. Okay? This is the idea of a smoke test. And by checking things in on an ongoing basis, like maybe a couple times a day, maybe once a day, maybe at most once every two days, something like that. Um, we're always checking, like, is my code going to so break the system that it's not even worth people to get? And if so, I'll have a sense of, of what exactly hit it in a small bit of code. It turns out that it's easier when you do this. When you take bite-sized bits of work, it's much easier to estimate them. And it also gives a sense of the progress of the project. It's kind of the pulse of the project. You have these builds going on, and each day you have a further and further development of system functionality and rolled together with people bundling together all their different uh, changes. It also forces developers to fix bugs before continuing. You don't go weeks and months just developing, 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 and only then find the problems down the road when you check in with other people. It forces you to top in at the same time. And finally, if you show this to customers or share it in the team, it gives a sense of more forward progress. Okay. It'll be useful in this class. That's all we have time for today. I've actually gone a little bit over. I appreciate your patience. Um, I will be contributing that description of a possible project, uh, if possible, later today, otherwise tomorrow. And uh, a video together with that, and I would welcome uh, aspects of your team choice. Okay. Thank you very much.